That's Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 to 26. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from good will. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. The second reading is taken from Acts chapter 9, verses 1 to 19. That's Acts chapter 9, verses 1 to 19. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul, for behold, he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him, so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house. And laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, 
the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you came, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized, and taking food, he was strengthened. Thanks for reading, and please keep open Acts chapter 9. 25 years after the events in our reading that we've just heard, Saul wrote a letter. And in the letter was a prayer, and in the prayer was a description of God. It goes like this. To him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work in us immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. God can do more than we would ever think to ask or imagine. That's what our God is like. Well, come and see that in action and look at Ananias. So for the third week running, the hero in our chapter of Acts is a very ordinary Christian. I don't think Saul is the hero. I think Ananias is the hero here. Um, He's a Christian who is facing persecution like most Christians around the world today. Uh, Imagine his last few months. I guess it took a few months, this. Um, He's heard about the persecutions in Jerusalem, and he is horrified, no doubt. And he prays, no doubt. But at first, this is about people who live three countries away. Um, Damascus, it, it is not part of ancient Israel. It's not part of Roman Judea. He's hearing about events far away on the news. And then the news changes. Persecution is coming here. At 9, verse 1, Saul, who breathes murder, that's what he's like. Saul has obtained letters to the synagogues of Damascus. The the secret police are coming. Um, 8, verse 3 told us Saul is the man who goes house to house. And 9 verse 2, if he finds anyone, Ananias, for example, who belongs to the way, the way of Jesus, then he will bring them back with him to Jerusalem. So imagine Ananias praying now, fervent, desperate, please rescue us. What do you think um, his sort of biggest request was? Um, I wonder what all that he could ask or imagine was. Um, Was it, you know, maybe uh, please could Saul's donkey get a flat tire on the way to Damascus so he never shows up? Um, Was it please could the Romans in Damascus, would they stand up to these letters and refuse to extradite? Or was it just very simply, please, please, please don't let Saul come to my house? What did he pray? Um, We don't know, but we do know what he had not ever imagined. And we know that never in his wildest dreams did he imagine Saul becoming his brother. Um, And we know that because when he has a vision from Jesus in our chapter telling him to go and speak to Saul, he says no until Jesus um, has to tell him again and tell him to go anyway. And then this week's ordinary hero walks down the road to secret police HQ Um, to knock on the door and say, I'm here from Jesus. And he finds that Jesus was right and that God can do more than we would ever ask or imagine. Our, Our main point this week, as it has been every week of this series, it is about God and his power. And it's about the progress of the gospel. Gospel advance, it is unstoppable because it depends on God and his power. Uh, which is infinite and unstoppable. For the the last time in our series, please look at the the box on the handouts, which gives you the shape of the book of Acts. Um, And it starts with a tiny group of terrified men and women in Jerusalem. But to that group in 1 verse 8, um, Jesus says, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. It's a huge, ambitious, impossible plan. 
Um, But that is not all that Jesus says in 1 verse 8. First, he says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses. God has decided that the gospel will advance and God's power has been committed to make sure that it happens. So the only question left is whether God is powerful enough to see his gospel advance, which is what the book of Acts then lays out for us. Throughout Acts, um, you see both internal and external barriers to the gospel going forward. Um, In our chapters, it is external and it is persecution. And we are here to learn and learn so deeply that we will rely on it all of our lives, no matter what circumstances we end up in, or if you're listening from outside this country, whatever circumstances you are in at the moment, we are here to learn that there is no barrier that God cannot remove or overcome, or actually even something more fun than remove or overcome, which is our story today. So we're going to look at Saul. Uh, Saul, the man who Ananias is so afraid of. And on the um, the handout, I've called him, point one, a terrible persecutor of Jesus. In the the series, we've called Saul the first inquisitor. This is a murderous hunter of Christians, pursuing them, dragging them out, keen for them to be imprisoned, and then killed, simply for following Jesus. And before we look at the the detail of Saul the persecutor, let me just repeat something that I said two weeks ago. Two weeks ago, I said that not everything that gets called persecution is persecution. It's quite important. Um, Two weeks ago, we said if someone asks you questions about your faith or argues with you, that is not persecution. That is an opportunity. That's what we call that. Uh, It's to be welcomed and engaged with. You may feel you want some help. Uh, Well, then you get the help of other Christians to help you engage with it well. Um, And please, anybody here or listening this morning who has questions about Christian faith, please ask them. Whether those questions come from your childhood of growing up in a Christian family, whether you come from miles outside of Christian things, whatever the questions are, please ask them. And that is what they did to Stephen in Acts chapter 6. They asked him questions. Um, And that is what they did to Stephen before they persecuted him. Um, It was only once they lost the argument with Stephen, because the reasons for the truth of the gospel were so strong, it was only once they lost the argument that they made a choice to turn to persecution. So that's something that's not persecution. Today, I want to add something else that is not persecution in the context of two long-awaited reports into abuse that were published this week. One of them about abuse by someone who I knew well, uh, or thought that I knew well. Uh, A proper investigation into allegations of abuse is not persecution. Proper investigation into allegations of abuse is not persecution. I'm sure there are repressive countries, repressive governments, where someone might use an investigation uh, into abuse to uh, persecute Christians. I'm sure there are, but we do not live there. Um, If you're listening online, you may live there, but we don't here in this country. And I hope it doesn't need to be said, but let me say it anyway, um, that if you report a concern about an employee or a volunteer or a church member here, um, you will not be treated as if you are persecuting them. Uh, In fact, you will be thanked, listened to, taken seriously, and your concern will be reported on to the proper authorities for investigation. Okay, well, with that said, let's look at what is persecution. And uh, as every week... Please, please keep in mind that this is real history. What we've got here in these chapters, it really happened. So verse 1, there is Saul breathing. And for Saul to breathe in and out is to breathe in and out threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. And he gets his letters of authority from the high priest. And it is clear that those letters are going to work. They give him all the power that he needs 
um, Roman government of these uh, regions. It was complex. There's lots of devolved power. And the synagogues in Damascus, even though they are far away from Jerusalem, um, these letters are going to give Saul everything that he needs with the community that he's going to persecute in. He's going to be allowed to go house to house. Uh, people like Ananias, they are going to be denounced to him by uh, those who live around him. And Saul is going to be allowed to drag them away to prison in Jerusalem, where they will be entirely at the mercy of the people who killed Stephen. Verse 13 gives us the, the authentic local view of Saul. Ananias says, Lord, I've heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. Uh, or flip the page. In verse 26, we get the authentic view of Christians in Jerusalem. Um, I hope you know, you've caught up the story, no spoilers, but um, Saul becomes a Christian and he shows up in Jerusalem and he wants to go to church. So he, you know, he tries, starts trying to go to church. And uh, verse 26, he attempted to join the disciples and they were all afraid of him for they did not believe that he was a disciple. Um, not surprising, is it, when the prisons in Jerusalem are full of all the people who Saul took with him last time he visited. Uh, we meet Saul in chapter 7 and in chapter 8. He had an official role on the day that they stoned Stephen to death. Do you know what it was? He was the coat monitor. What a role. I wonder if he got a little badge for coat monitor. You wouldn't want your coat to get lost, would you, while you're busily stoning an innocent man to death? So don't worry. Um, Saul is going to run a cloakroom for you, and here's your ticket. And uh, maybe you think that was just his job. Well, don't think that. Chapter 22, Saul, Paul, uh, he confirms, I myself was standing by and approving and watching over the garments of those who killed him. That's who Saul is. Saul is named as the key agent of the great persecution that scattered all the Christians in Jerusalem. 8 verse 3, Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. I've put as well two references to his later letters. Um, one of them, he uses a piece of graphic medical vocabulary to talk about how horrifying he was as a person because I persecuted the church of God. And the other reference, he makes a list. Formerly, I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent. In fact, uh, I was the foremost sinner. And I've tried to indicate in my headings just how personal this chapter is. I wasn't expecting that actually beforehand, um, but Jesus, he is personally involved uh, and he is talked about again and again and again in this chapter. So each heading um, I've put about Jesus. So just look at 9 verse 4 to see that. Uh, the light is flashing all around him. Saul, he falls to the ground and a voice speaks, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And this is not a political or philosophical disagreement. This isn't a local rivalry. And this isn't about Ananias or his friends, really. This is about Jesus. You are doing this to me. Which, really, that would need to be included in the handbook for dictators that I spoke about last week, wouldn't it? Uh, maybe it should be the, the final chapter, or maybe it would be the health warning at the beginning. Um, so in this book, I'm going to tell you how to persecute Christians, um, dictators. If you weren't here last week, that's what we said. They might need some help with that. And uh, we'll tell them what works and what doesn't. But just a warning. When you hurt a Christian, you hurt Jesus. And he is the judge of the living and the dead. Uh, Saul is a terrible persecutor of Jesus, uh, one who breathes murder against Jesus. And there was a degree of ignorance with him, verse 5. He says, who are you, Lord? But it was ignorance about the importance of the person he was persecuting, not about who he was persecuting. Uh, as soon as uh, Jesus says, I am Jesus, the Lord is Jesus whom you are persecuting. Notice as well, there is no mitigation in the future career of Saul. Um, and there's nothing in Saul 
that means that God needs him for anything. I've sometimes heard people say that. Uh, you know, God chose Saul because he needed his gifts or his background or his preaching ability. No, that is to profoundly misunderstand this chapter. And it, it opens a profoundly dangerous door to say that God might treat people differently because he needs their skills as an apologist or a preacher. No. And this chapter, it is about the power of God to advance his gospel unstoppably. His power, not Paul's or Saul's. And I don't think until studying this I'd, I, recently, I'd really seen the contrast between Saul and Stephen so clearly. It was this week the penny dropped on that for me. Um, see, what do people say? People say that God might need Saul because they needed a Greek-speaking Jewish man who understood both cultures expertly and had um, particular training and gifts of wisdom, needed someone who could really win those kind of public arguments on the big stage. But that is exactly how Stephen is described in Acts chapter 6. That is the, the identical package of things that went with Stephen. God didn't need one of those. He had one already until Saul killed him. So this point one is a terrible persecutor of Jesus who, point two, becomes a chosen instrument of Jesus. And each week I've said really we're just looking at one verse each week so let me read our verse this week. It's verse 15 it's on the handouts, and it is Jesus speaking to Ananias. This is why he should risk his life knocking on the door of the secret police HQ. Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. There is no barrier that God cannot remove or overcome, or something even more fun than remove or overcome. No barrier that God cannot turn into an instrument of his. And again, um, just before we look at the detail, I want to make one more important qualification. Um, notice that this is not a passage about the rehabilitation of criminals into church ministry. Um, Saul's story, it is not legitimately used by abusers when they ask for a second chance and a way to continue in church ministry. I hope the differences are obvious, but let's lay out a few of them. Um, Saul, in verse 1, he is not a Christian. hope that's clear. Um, he's not in church ministry, nor does he go quickly into church pastoral responsibility. Um, another big difference is that his behavior is not kept quiet, but is known everywhere. Um, he is an example of someone to whom God showed extraordinary grace. And the, um, the references on the sheet under point one will give you his feelings on that. Um, but that is not in focus here in Acts chapter 9. Um, and it was in 2002, uh, nearly 20 years ago, that the Boston Globe newspaper first shone a spotlight on the practice of moving an abuser to a new place because you believe their promise that they won't do it again. And that is not Christian generosity. That is a failure to protect the innocent and the weak. And nothing in this chapter gives grounds for it. Um, so this chapter, this chapter, it is about the power of God. There is no barrier that God cannot remove or overcome or turn into an instrument of his. And again, notice how very, very personal this is. Um, he is a chosen instrument of mine. He will carry my name. Uh, and it will go, his name, before the Gentiles. That's the, the big shock of the book of Acts that we're building up to. And before kings. And here is where it gets really very personal because Jesus means that Saul will end up in a room with the emperor Nero. So you have the real king of the world, Jesus, 
telling Saul that he's going to go and have a conversation with the man who thinks he's the ruler of the world. And that is how personal this is going to get and how dangerous this is going to get for Saul. Um, And also to the children of Israel, who um, you don't need guesswork to know that they are going to hate their former inquisitor for his change of allegiance. And chosen instrument, that means that Saul joins all the other Christians in the book of Acts in speaking about Jesus, in proclaiming and testifying and arguing, and all the rest of the the rich overlapping vocabulary in the book of Acts. The rest of the book of Acts and the rest of his life, it is full of what it means to be a chosen instrument of Jesus in the advance of the gospel. He speaks and he speaks and he speaks. In fact, um, over the page, the, the rest of the chapter says how he does that immediately. Um, to their amazement. Can you imagine the amazement? The inquisitor is coming. That's going to be great. And here he is. Let's, let's hear what he has to say. And what he has to say is Jesus. Jesus really is the Lord, the King. Um, and one of the key words there is preached boldly, which is a word that means total freedom of speech. That's what Saul had. Um, again, relates to what we said last week. Silence is what stops the advance of the gospel, not persecution. And at the moment that Saul is converted, he has freedom of speech. And freedom of speech doesn't mean that he had a piece of paper saying that he could speak freely without consequences. Doesn't mean that the diversity policy was signed up to that. Doesn't mean that there was a law saying he could do that. Saul knew really well that he didn't have legal freedom of speech. The the whole system of persecution had his name on it. He'd been running it. Freedom of speech comes from inside Saul by the Holy Spirit and enables him to speak regardless of what is going to happen to him. This is a 180 degree flip in Saul. Um, Saul knows every single book of the scriptures thoroughly. So in his case, all it takes is three words in verse 5. I am Jesus. The, The Lord at the right hand side of God Almighty, he is Jesus. And at that moment, everything that Saul knows snaps into a totally different arrangement. Jesus, oh, he was not a fraud and an imposter. He is the Lord. Um, Christians, they are not a threat to the people of God and the temple. They are the people of God and the temple. Jesus' death, it was not a failure and a curse from God. Actually, it was our curse, Paul's curse, Saul's curse, born in his place by Jesus in his death. And uh, when Jesus starts giving him orders in the next breath in verse 6, Saul obeys without question and goes on obeying for the rest of his life until it costs him his life. And that the turnaround in Saul is utterly extraordinary, isn't it? And we're in Central Focus, um, we're hoping to have some Zoom conversations with friends in the next few weeks about Easter, and there've been um, three different videos recorded for that. Um, One uh, on the sort of meaning of the cross and Easter, um, one that would help you have those discussions, particularly with Muslim friends. But one of them is about the evidence, uh, why why we think Jesus really rose, why we think there's really good evidence for that. And one of the bits of evidence in there is Saul and what happened to him, his testimony. What would it take to turn someone who only wanted to murder Christians into someone who was prepared to risk his life to preach Jesus three days later. What would do that? Well, we have the man's own explanation. He says what changed him was meeting a not dead Jesus. It was that level of explanation that totally made him reevaluate. Jesus is risen. And so the persecutor, the terrible persecutor, becomes the chosen instrument and it is glorious what God did and extraordinary how powerful God is and we shouldn't get sort of carried away to think that God promises to do this to every persecutor or everyone who ever disagrees with Christians I'm told that um, Richard Dawkins is so paranoid about this that he is planning to record his death so that um, and broadcast it maybe so that no Christian can ever say that Richard Dawkins became a Christian on his deathbed 
Um, no, these kind of things doesn't happen often. Um, but we don't want to lose how amazing this story is. And I think sometimes, maybe particularly here, um, we focus on Paul, the letter writer, and Paul, the theologian, and uh, we forget just how extraordinary his life story is and how extraordinary what God did to him. Um, there's an old film called The Untouchables, uh, and in The Untouchables, there's a scene when Sean Connery tells Kevin Costner how to take down Al Capone. Uh, here's the quote, quite a well-known quote. He says, he pulls a knife, you pull a gun. He sends one of yours to the hospital, you send one of his to the morgue. That's the Chicago way. Well, that is not Jesus' way because Jesus is more powerful than Kevin Costner uh, or the FBI or the United States government. What does Jesus say? In this chapter, he says, well, put one of mine in the morgue and I will raise him to be forever with me where you cannot touch him again. That's stage one. And then what I will do, I will put one of yours in his place. Isn't that stunning how powerful Jesus is? And we said uh, just a few minutes ago, God doesn't need Saul. He had Stephen. And that doesn't stop us from enjoying the way that Saul replaces Stephen so thoroughly. Just imagine the authorities. Imagine how pleased they were with how things were going in chapter 7, chapter 8. Stephen is dead. Uh, we've got this guy Saul and our prisons are full. We can do whatever we want. No one is ever going to argue again like Stephen did for Jesus. We've won. Until Jesus just reaches over and steals their star player. Um, no one in the power of God, no one does more to open up the racial mix of God's people than Saul, uh, to burst it out of the, the barriers that they wanted to keep there. No one does more to change the customs of Moses than their star persecutor. Um, the one who they commissioned to go on journeys to stop the gospel well, give him 14 years, and then you'll hear about him making some journeys again. And this time he carries letters written on hearts by Jesus as he carries the gospel to the very end of the earth. It's stunning how the book of Acts pivots around this moment. Um, Luke, the author, he could have made different choices in his book, but I think he's laughing at the authorities, laughing at how powerless they are to stop the gospel. And he could have told us loads more about what the 12 apostles did in Jerusalem, but really soon, we're only really following the story of this 13th apostle, this strange 13th apostle, as the focus shifts from Jerusalem to Rome in the hands of their previous star player. Okay, well, time is going fast, so the next two points will be fairly brief. Um, let me read verse 15 and 16 again. Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. And I've put um, point two, he becomes a chosen instrument of Jesus. Point three, and a sufferer for Jesus. And um, I'm going to ask you to cross out the word and there. Um, normally, when I'm training uh, people in Bible handling, I encourage them not to use the word and, um, because normally that means you haven't quite understood the link between two ideas. Normally, and is too weak. Um, and I, I don't have a good heading for you still, but I'm very clear that verse 16 doesn't say and, does it? It says for. Go, um, tell him about the chosen instrument thing. For, I will show him how much he must suffer. Chosen instrument means suffering. There's a, a direct connection between the two. For, um, maybe which of course means a sufferer for Jesus. So with not very much time, just notice some important things. Anyone who says, choose me, Jesus, um, better know what they're saying. It's not that suffering for Jesus, it is automatic or constant, but it is that suffering for the gospel is typical and nearly always unavoidable in the end. Um, Jesus, uh, in his ministry before his death, he said, um, uh, I will go to the cross 
And then he said to Christians, pick up your cross and follow me. It is the same deal for us as for him. Uh, Or think of Stephen's sermon two weeks ago. Uh, Which of the prophets did you not persecute? This is how it has always been and always will be. No surprises. God's power means gospel advance, but it does not mean an easy life. But that's okay, as we said last week, because persecution doesn't stop the gospel. It's only silence that does that. We also, uh, there's a word we've used, particularly a couple of weeks ago, we used the word martyr, um, as in Stephen is the first Christian martyr. Um, And what I decided not to say then, but to keep for this week, is that the word martyr, um, it just means, it exactly means the word witness. To be a witness for Jesus is to invite martyrdom. To be a martyr for Jesus is the supreme act of witness about Jesus. And Paul's life gives plenty of evidence of this truth, doesn't it? Even in this chapter, um, you know, people sometimes say, oh, I met Jesus and uh, my life just got better and better and better after that. Well, Saul meets Jesus and uh, immediately afterwards he is led into town, not in the kind of pompous pr- pr- uh, parade that he expected. He is led in stumblingly by the hand because he can't see. And when he leaves the town, it's even worse, it seems, from how he talks about it. He's sort of humiliatingly stuffed into a, a basket with the smelly laundry and lobbed out the window. Um, Even just in these first few weeks of his life, they try to kill him repeatedly. We're we're doing 1 Thessalonians in Central Focus this term, um, and uh, he's able to say there, um, from the moment you became Christians, I did not hide from you the fact that suffering was coming. Um, Saul knows the system of persecution because he was the system. Um, And he steps into it, knowing exactly what he's doing. Okay, and then fourth point, what I want to do is look at applications for us. Um, And the applications for us, um, we are not Saul. Um, Verse 15, verse 16 is not addressed to us. Um, We are the church, uh, or part of it. And we are addressed in verse 31. So what I want you to do is turn the page to Acts chapter 9, verse 31 which is one of the the regular summaries that comes through the book of Acts to tell us how the gospel is doing uh, and what God has been doing, how the progress is going. So let me read you verse 31. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. And we're we're not told for certain where the peace came from. It may just be so simple as to say that with Saul taken off the payroll, um, there was no one else who could really be bothered to persecute Christians at that time. Um, I don't know. Maybe the persecution carried on. But certainly this verse is about the lessons that the church drew from what happened to Saul. And you see, I've tried to lay out on the handout some of the sort of structure of the original sentence. And there are two things they learn. And they learn something about the fear of the Lord and something about the comfort or the um, urging, the encouragement of the Holy Spirit. So fear of the Lord, you really would learn that from Saul, wouldn't you? From what happened to Saul? Um, Who are you going to be afraid of? Um, The big persecutor like Saul with his letters from the chief priests and his prisons? um, Or the God who can reach down and swap him with three words? whenever he wants. Uh, Who's really more to be feared, um, the persecutor or the God of the whole world? And how about the comfort and the urging of the Holy Spirit? Well, look what the Holy Spirit did in Saul. Again, here we have someone who only breathes threats of murder, and he is turned in an instant into someone who breathes out the message of Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit. So take courage, be built up. Um, And the key word at the end of the verse is multiply. Um, The point of these three weeks, it is God's power and the advance of the gospel. And the gospel advances by speaking, by the speaking of ordinary Christians, no matter what is going on around them, no matter what situation they are in. So 
speak, however bad it gets. Um, last week, I put a little bit on, on why I've chosen for these three weeks um, to speak about this. And as I said last week, the, the reason I'm pitching for a few years' time, I think, um, though, again, if you're listening from a different country, it may well be that this uh, chapter is exactly what you need to hear now because of what you are going through. And we have much to learn from brothers and sisters in countries where persecution is already active and hostile. But um, maybe in a few years' time, maybe not, maybe in a few decades' time, um, however bad it gets, speak. There is nothing else uh, that is, has the sort of power of God written uh, underneath it in the same way. If you're not sure what to do one day, not sure what the best response is to what's happening, well, just speak. Go and tell someone about Jesus. Go and find someone who's not a Christian and tell them the gospel. Uh, if we are bowed down and wrestling with internal and external threats, as the church uh, in the book of Acts was from the very beginning, as all the letters show they continued to be, well, just tell someone about Jesus. Um, because Acts 1 verse 8, Jesus promised that those who have his spirit have the power of God as they go to be witnesses, uh, even to the end of the earth. So let me pray for us to be like the church in those days. Our Father, we do pray that we would be built up and we pray that we would walk in the fear of you, not the fear of human beings, and that we would walk in the comfort of your Holy Spirit, and that you would help us. You know where we fear others more than you. You know where we need that comfort and that power. And we ask our Father, you would help us, that we would have courage to speak, and that as we speak, we ask that you would do your work in power, and that the church would multiply those who you are saving by the death of your Lord, of the Lord Jesus, your son. And we ask this in his name.